Oh, hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of Tuesday Night Live brought to you by Crowcast. We're here again, it's a very big week being showdown week and a bit on the line this week and to talk about it, everything to do with the Crows and a little bit about the AFL. I'm joined by Peter J. How are you going Peter? Good Fiend, very pleased to be here tonight. Very good and Macca of course, how are you going Mac? Uh, not too bad, I'm a bit drowsy, I had a bit of a nop yesterday and uh, still got some anaesthetic in me so. Oh, that's no Oh, good. you kept that to yourself mate, What? Yeah. Uh, everything okay? Uh, I had a few uh, kennels can- cancers that had to be cut out and um, that's been done but uh, if, I'm, you know, if I talk more rubbish than normal, <laughs> people will understand why <laughs> You're just making oh, up an excuse So we've got Pete oh, with the ankle with you, and, and Macca with his anaesthetic and then we've got Donkey <laughs> who doesn't need any sort of drugs to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, gone, donkey. Right. Oh, uh, oh, natural. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is completely un uninhibited, un- donkey. But uh, you're probably getting as much sense out of me as we'll be to Mackinac. Happy days. <laughs> and of course, good evening to everyone who's listening live on the chat. Don't forget, you can listen to us live uh, on eight th- at eight thirty on Spreaker or the Spreaker app. Um, or via our website, AFL Crowcast. So good day to uh, all those in the chat, and thanks very much for joining us. And we'll crack right along with uh, some news, and I've got music. I did have music. Here we go. <laughs> Bit going on this week, couple of suspensions and whatnot. It always seems to be the tribunal that that throws up uh, all sorts of stuff. I I'll lead off with uh, just you know as usual hilarity from Vic Media Incorporated with uh, some of the reaction tonight to Tom Hawkins pleading guilty to his um, uh, touching the umpire charge. You know uh, tweets from the Vic Media like oh what a classy guy and and um, all this kind of stuff. You know oh why couldn't all the other players you know be like Tom and you know I'm thinking what sort of a low Bar standard are we putting up for players when you know he's, he's touched the umpire you know he's been reported he's been referred he's pled guilty what else could he do he's copped his match and then he's a classy guy I mean they just and continue well, to amaze me the media over there you're 100% right because what they're saying is rubbish because uh, he, he was also told to get two games if he pleaded not guilty mm. So uh, there's nothing classy about the guy at all. Terry Wallace on SEN today was saying he should get a fine and that we shouldn't be, uh, the match review panel decisions shouldn't be geared towards trying to avoid situations occurring at lower levels of the game. It's like, what are you talking about? The guy touched an umpire. It's the biggest no-no in the sport. Unbelievable. Yeah, well, Terry Wallace is the biggest nuff-nuff in the sport. Oh, God, they just sometimes. Uh, And then, of course, there was the Nat Newey issue as well. Well, that man, yeah. I can't. I can't believe he got suspended actually because I've watched it uh, very closely, and he actually didn't. He tackled him around the waist, and it was definitely a push in the back. But the guy did have arms free, and he, but he chose to hang onto the ball really tightly rather than use his arms to brace himself. So I, I, I think. think I have to say, they, Mac, I, t- I tend to agree with you. Well, I tend to agree with you at, at first blush, but I, I have to say that I was interested today on social media to see somebody put up a montage of um, some of Nat Newey's tackles over the last couple of years. They are vigorous. And there is no doubt that he has a um, an MO whereby he gets himself over the top and throws the full force of his body jamming the player you know, on the ground, it's all, almost like the um, you know the, the the WWE move. So um, I don't know yeah. whether that's a build up of stuff from that Nui, but it is you know given the size he you know the frame he's got, um, it is a dangerous tackle, and um, you know he's got he's got form not in the sense that he's been you know punished for it before, but if you looked at the, you know three or four of his tackles over the journey, they are you know they don't make for pretty viewing, I have to say. Well, no, and if, is there's, true. there's a thing in it. Go, sorry, go, go donkey. Sorry, I was going to say there's a there's a part in what you're saying too, Pete. Um, and anyone that's played a bit of league before, it's the second movement in the tackle. So he gets them over and takes them off their balance, and then because he's usually taller, he actually pushes off from the ground to really drive them into it as well. So there's a second, mm. there's a second driving movement. But the only thing in the, that he does do that quite a bit. But in this one, this was a dead straight run straight at him and right into his back. Um, I didn't try to turn him or anything. It was just. Bang, straight on top. Yeah, but 
Yeah, and it, but the thing is, is that he, he then intentionally lands with the full force of his body, which is massive. But, on top of the yeah, but that's, but that's only a free kick. I mean, I don't mm. feel that's, that's like... I mean, it, the dangerous tackle law is about sling tackles, so it's about the yeah. second movements. And, and despite, oh, I, don't, I don't disagree with that, Fane. I, I don't yeah. disagree with it, and I don't, I don't necessarily agree he needed to be suspended. But I think it was just interesting to see a montage of his, mm. of, you know, three or four of the, that similar kind of tackle, which really does put yeah. the hurt on. Well, and the funny thing is that, um, as has been highlighted, uh, for some of those uh, tackles, he's actually received free kicks for for holding the ball. Mm. So they've been yeah. deemed by the officiating umpire to be holding the pool. Oh, I'll tell you what, if it was one of ours, I'd be jumping up and down. I wouldn't be happy oh, yeah, with no, the West true, Coast. Yeah, no, true, true. Um, and then, of course, uh, we've got uh, poor old Paddy McCartan again. Um, his career must be highly in doubt at the moment, uh, having yeah, to I, sit, sit out again. I raised him some weeks back. I, I just don't think he is going to have a career. That's uh, uh, He... he for medical reasons, he can't get as fit as he would like to get, and uh, he seems to get uh, knocked out pretty easy. Mm. Yeah, well, this one's supposedly whiplash, which is more of a, a neck issue, um, and obviously, as we were talking about last week, the concussion is very much about rattling around, the, the brain rattling around in the skull. Yep. And uh, he's obviously very susceptible, and when you uh, when you factor in his uh, uh, diabetes issues as well, uh, as you point out, Macca, you got to feel sorry for the kid, but it doesn't really look good, does it? No, not long term. No. And then, of course, for the Crows, uh, we've got another hammy. No, oh, isn't that behind the knee tendonitis joint thing? I think it's oh, a, hammy. a hammy. No, it's, it's, it's been released on the news today. He's out for one or two with a hammy. Oh, no, there was some, um, wasn't there some bizarre medical term they tried to uh, attach to it? Um, knee, knee tendonitis initially. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a hamstring now, but they tried to cough up some other medical term for it. But it's definitely a hammy, and yeah, look, I mean, you know, it's been talked about ad nauseum, yeah. and they've obviously got huge problems down there. And the, the worst thing about it is just the way that you know, just the idiotic way they seem to want to go about, you know, reporting it. And I don't know, um, they just think must think we're idiots. I, I think the term you're looking for, Peter, is uh, distal tendon irritation behind his knee. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> What crap! Uh, but we'll miss him against uh, Port. Uh, of course think, we will. You know oh, that bounce player. that he's provided off half back is yeah, quite key to our ball movement and our transition. And uh, yeah, we're getting a few back, but uh, missing Miller in the form that he's been in won't be good. And uh, you know that's eight now for the season. Ridiculous. Mm. Any well, other the worst news? Thing is Miller, was it, it, oh, he was God. just hitting his straps. You know, yeah. he just he was just starting to make that position his own, and then suddenly he goes out for two weeks. It's just you know. Uh, Anyway, yeah, it's uh, not good, and uh, surely there must be an internal review going on at the Crows with regards to their their pre season work this year because uh, it's been. I, I think the danger has been that they've tried to prepare themselves on a short uh, uh, short time frame for the season, and I think it's whatever they've done. It's back. It seems to have backfired. Mm. Yeah, I was reading. I was reading on the uh, big footy board that um, someone was saying we had some machine that we decided to stop using in the middle of last week. That was supposed to be about reg- leg strength, and it's not. Um, and uh, we abandoned it last week. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that's true, and we um, oh, um, stop using man. hammies. Well, um, Nikki, Nikki on the chat keeps telling us that it's not a hamstring, so she's um, uh, uh, she's either in the know or a drunk the Kool Aid. Well, Nikki, uh, Nikki, what is it then? You can tell us on the chat because uh, it, six hours ago it was released by the club that it was a hamstring, low grade, probably miss yeah, a week. I think he'd been drinking again. <laughs> mm. Yep. We have talked about that a lot on the chat. Anyway, if there's, uh, I can't think of any other real news, so why don't we move on to uh, a little bit of talk about the Carlton game on the weekend, for particularly for you and Donkey, uh, Pete. What would you make of it all? Macca and I have had our say. Oh, look, I um, went to the game, but I, I think that really the um, – uh, uh, I went back because I'm sitting on the couch at home at the moment. I, um, I went back yesterday and had a good look at the game on um, on replay. And, um, gee, I was uh, incredibly impressed with our first quarter. It was some of the, some of the best ball movement I can remember – our, our side playing it was just you know to go back and look at it on replay um if you haven't done so i'd recommend it because uh you can 
get lost in the fact that, you know, it fell away, uh, particularly in the second quarter. But, um, uh, gee, that first was, was superb. Yeah, and the, and the second quarter, someone pointed out to me a bit later that we, we still are only outscored four goals to two. So it wasn't like it was one of the, the massive sort of slaughtering things. Oh, you know, it was horrible, but but at least the signs were there. And, you know, we, when we've been, you know, coughing and spluttering a little bit to yeah. see the, the way that they can play on uh, on show in that first quarter was it was just some amazing football. Some of the, some of the transfer of play and there was one... Um, um, one bit of play which ended up with the uh, um, Darcy Fogarty taking a mark at centre half forward and finished off with a lovely pass to McGovern in the pocket. Who golden? That started right back from defence, and it was just a chain of of really laser, you know, thirty forty metre passes zip zapping around the ground. And you know, um, it was just you know they talk about some of the skills going from the game. It was really high quality football. So you know, from that point of view, it was really really good. Obviously, fell away in the second quarter, but then did what they had to do um, in the third and fourth. So, um, but yeah, really impressed with some of our play. Interesting enough, Pete, that uh, first quarter that you were impressed with, and which, and rightly so, is a quarter when uh, I think if I'm, I think I'm correct in saying this, Carlton had uh, seven defence and five forwards, which meant that in our uh, back lines we had a loose player, which uh, which we used to advantage in set up play and just whipping down the field very quickly and getting goals. Um, and after quarter time, they went uh, man for man on man. And, uh, and that turned more into a struggle. And uh, we were still trying to play the same way in the second quarter for a little while and uh, that backfired on us. So I think the reason, it's interesting enough that with more defenders in our, in our forward line that we went better because we could set it up from, from the back. Mm. Do we... I thought I saw somewhere too that we changed our rotations a bit in the second quarter. Like we had um, Matt Crouch and that sort of not contesting all the centre bounces and, and a few things like that. Somebody that's a bit smarter and paid more attention might be able to confirm that. But I think we, I think we actually play with our rotations to see what people do. You saw Betts and Jenkins in the back line at one stage. Seemed that way, just donkey. Really uh, and mate, I wouldn't waste that beautiful new microphone by not talking into it either. Um, get your mouth yeah. around right around that bad boy. Um, but you're right. I noticed uh, a, a few <laughs> little. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, let me tell you that that said to me. Hello, Phoenix. <laughs> so that's much better. That's how you're getting the it's most lovely. out of that nice condenser. It's really lovely to see you. Oh my yeah. god! Shut up. Um, you're right. There, there was some change ups in the second quarter. I, I thought. Um, but Pete, referring to that ball movement in the first quarter, I reckon if you looked at any Crows training gr- drill on a Wednesday night, that's exactly what you'd see. It's about as close to a training drill as you could possibly get on game day, I think. Yeah, we've still got to execute the skill, and and um, um, it was uh, it was mighty. You know, I, I, I couldn't help but be impressed with um, you know, with the way they did it. So it was, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, look, I, you know, the op- obviously the opposition was not great, but um, I think there were some good signs there for us. Yep. Absolutely. Um, what are your impressions, uh, Donkey and Pete? Macker and I and Nikki were talking on Sunday night that uh, this slight change in the way that we transition the ball this year is uh, a direct uh, attempt to counter um, that frenetic uh, uh, pressure game style that was brought up to us uh, by Richmond and Co. last year. Do you see that being... Uh, because it's definitely a change from that run-and-gun chaos style to a very much more considered... Uh, Ball movement. I think if you have a look back at the the Geelong preliminary final, I think that the blueprint was there in that game. We saw a lot of really close lead up passes. I remember a lot of times where there wasn't the big kick down the line. We 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 changed what we were doing, and there was people leading up to the ball. And that was one of the things I noticed about the grand final not happening was we weren't supporting our players off the ball like we were. We were sort of playing one out in a way. Um, and it looks like a lot of the games where we we're playing really well this year. We're uh, we're definitely um, doing that work off the ball to present an option that's good enough to be kicked to. So I think that's um, yeah. Yeah, something yeah. I've liked to see. Yeah, it reminds yeah. me a little bit of Hawthorne a few years ago. You yeah, know, where, where exactly. you're just denying, you're actually just denying um, the, the the opposition time with ball in hand. Um, and uh, you know, the less time they've got the ball, the the less damage they can do to you. And that, that you know, if you've got the skills to be able to do that, um, then then well and good. But yeah, I agree that, it, that there does seem to be. A change, um, and I think that that also reflects not having you know guys like Brody Smith who can you know mm. 
building the you know running and giving i mean we've had season play very very well but i guess but um you know smith sort of was a real architect of that you know running 50 60 meter kick and yeah. so yeah and and also you know we had that you know the great forward line that was taking advantage of that and, and Betts was having his way you know on the ground and and that all just closed up it all just closed up and so um i think you're right that the and you'd be disappointed if there wasn't some kind of reaction in the game plan For sure. to try and counter that. Yeah. Um, and um, there is another, there is another major change though, Pete and Donkey, in the sense that um, last year we were very much uh, centre conscious. We tried to always go through the middle as much as we could. Whereas this year, we, what we seem to be about is changing direction all the time. We're going left, right, then maybe coming straight back to where we started. The idea is just to create the openings rather than try and, and go through a pinhole opening. So Took the words right out of my mouth, Mac. I was, I was just about to say then. That I, I, I reckon, no, 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 absolutely fine. Bring up the point. Um, it's, it's, a good, it's a really good point. And, and it, it seems to me that we're, um, I think, I just noticed it quite a lot on, on the weekend as well. We, we seem to be trying to use width yeah. a, a lot more than what we yeah. did the year before. And, and I think that if you're um, – um, without wanting to overthink it too much, I think that the only way that you succeed on the MCG is is to use the width, It'd be because it's the what you know, it's, it's the widest ground. And I noticed that it worked for us against Sydney. That that we you know that was one of the things that we did really well yeah. was use the width, and hence we had you know Atkinson Seedsman having great games. And I just I just sense that. Yeah, that there is definitely a change in tactic there, and I think that rather than that, that looking for that centre corridor all the time, you know, the use of width seems to be part of our mo this year. Yeah, it's very much. I think the corridor can be a bit of a myth, and I think we've worked out that the and this is like as you pointed out earlier, Peter. It's exactly what Hawthorne used to do. You and you just have to shift the zone, and if you keep moving the ball relatively quickly and and using angles and and all the rest of it, you're constantly shifting that zone of the opposition. And uh, I think we were talking about this last week as well that you only have to find that little break, um, and then you can move the ball forward. And um, mm. I, I just think it looks far more composed and and far more professional and. Um, it protects the downside a little bit because you're not all getting ahead of the ball um, as we sometimes were prone to do when we were slingshotting off half back. Yeah. And, and basketball, and, I mean, you know, basketball, you, that's how you play it. You know, that's how you, you mm, if you're faced yeah. with a zone, you, you know, you kick it around, you just keep kicking it around until you can pull the zone out of play and rather than just have, make an early play of trying to dump the ball into the centre for a, you know, for a, for a, um, a, a contested play. So I think that, yeah, I feel like we're doing much more of that approach where, as you say, you're trying to drag the zone from side to side. And it's interesting, mm-hmm. Vardy on the chat, sorry to interrupt, Vardy on the chat mentions that he feels that we're lacking a certain awe that we had last year, uh, maybe related to the lower scores. And that's probably a fair observation because we were blowing teams away at times uh, last year and we, we had that, you know, uh, dare I yeah. mention it, crowbot feel about it. But I just yeah, feel we, that I don't all think that... we've had the cattle on the park. No, but I think also I, I don't actually mind that too much because, as as I just mentioned, it seems like a more considered approach. Um, and whilst uh, whilst it doesn't have that that you know total footy look about it, you know that beautiful footy look about it, um, I think it's protecting the downside risk and and it's, it's stopping us from getting opened up so much uh, on the on the turnover. Um, and it just seems like a, a an uh, like it's taxing because people need to run and present and all the rest of it. But that's far easier doing that diagonally across the ground than it is running from half forward to half back to half forward to half back. You know, twenty times a, mm. a quarter. It just seems to be a more um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? A sustainable game plan, if that makes sense. Well, and let's be honest. From what we've seen so far this year, Richmond haven't changed. And, and, and they probably don't need to change. They will turn up, uh, and they'll be in the grand final this year. It's, yeah. you know, the, the next 16 games, they've got five games against top eight sides, and they've yeah. got uh, eight of their next – sorry, 15 – next 15 games, they've got eight at the MCG, yeah. and they've got six against top eight sides. So, anyway, they'll be – and they'll have two MCG finals. So, they will be in the grand final. There is nothing sure. Mm. Um, and so, they will bring the same game plan. Why wouldn't they? And I would be horrified if we turned up without something different, if we get that far. Yep. And it's good to see the coaches' uh, panel have obviously thought about that 
and been proactive about it. Let's yep. uh, move on and talk about uh, the showdown, shall we? bit on it this week i reckon uh port a game out of the eight and in or da- well, sorry percentage at the moment out of the eight but in danger of dropping a game out of the eight uh certainly not exceeding their expectations and a chance for us to really solidify a top four spot uh before the buy which is a bit of a bonus considering we've been scratchy oh look it's always a 50 50 go you know we all know that and i'm surprised at some of the, you know, um, the, you know, I think we're a dollar fifty or something like that, and you know, we we seem to be carrying fairly heavy favouritism into the game, and I'm not quite sure why we would be. Um, we haven't got, you know, particularly greater form than what what Port have at the moment. I don't think. Um, so, I, you know, I expect a very very close contest um, in terms of ins and outs. I think uh, obviously we've lost Miller. Uh, we talked about it at the start of the show and. Um, I would imagine that Walker and Sloan will be available and um, Miller and um, Darcy Fogarty will go out, um, I would say, would be the two the two changes. Testing, donkey, one, two, Macca, no. testing. Sorry. <laughs> testing. Oh, I'm here. I forgot that, I forgot that uh, Macca wasn't here. I usually let him have first serve. Um, uh, yeah, look, I think... I think I agree with those changes. Um, maybe not as well. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think that our form line is actually quite considerably better than Ports, to be honest. Um, I think that we've put um, some probably poorer opponents away a little bit more convincingly than they have. Um, that we uh, we've had uh, the non-event in Collingwood, and I think that we probably were suffering from round one grand final blues against Essendon. Um, so I kind of write both those losses off, um, uh, whether that's right or not. So I, I feel like we've actually been, when we're playing footy against sides that we're really, really switched on and ready to go for, um, we've been we've been playing really good, decent footy and putting it at what we need to do up. So uh, I think that we are do have the form on. I do think that they're a broken club with a broken culture, and I don't think they're going to be able to perform on the weekend. I worry about, um, because they'll have Ryder back this week, won't they? Well, he's been playing. Um, yeah. I worry about uh, the centre work. I, I Source didn't look terribly convincing last week against that young lad. Um, and Ryder is pretty good around the ground. And uh, while Source did a bit of work around the ground uh, last week, uh, he's not getting off. The, he's you know nowhere near as athletic as, as Paddy. And uh, I don't dismiss Port's first uh, midfield rotation. They can do some damage. Um, so And we all know what... Port are like when they get their tails up a bit. Um, yeah. You know, they can score quickly, they get on a roll, uh, they have some dangerous players that can bob up and bite you, you know, after being non existent for three and a half quarters. So uh, pro- it's probably uh, the midfield battle uh, and the ruck battle that have me worried. I think at either end of the ground we've got them covered, um, but we need a big game from, from Sauce and, and Jenkins when he's in the ruck as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah, spent yeah. the week. Um, I spent the last few days defending. God knows why I need, why anybody needs to do this, but um, defending Cam Ellis Yeoman from uh, from that seems to be just an endless oh. list of haters. Um, you know uh, his statistics and his um, you know what he's done so far this year is just through the roof. And I, I really like. Uh, you know, I've got an incredible like for what. Both he and Greenwood are doing for us at the moment. Um, those two big bodies in the guts, and if you look at the AFL statistics, so though you know those two, um, you know contest that you know they, at our club they're one and two for you know contested possessions, one and two for tackles. You know they they are a real bash brothers in there, and mm-hmm. I think that what it does is it, it really gives us some flexibility with um, with uh, with Rory Sloan coming back in. I mean he just doesn't need to be. In that, you know, he can uh, have, uh, you know, I would have thought of a bit of flexibility in what he does and, and whilst he may well go into the middle at various times, um, I think that we can, you know, we can get the dirty work done inside without it. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are there, but I, I think that he's been, um, those two have been a revelation for us this year and um, he's, uh, I think that 
I think he's, I think Cam is like he's number one at the club for center clearances. He's number two for um, total clearances. He's number four in total possessions. He's number two in tackling. He's number two in contested possessions. Like he's just killing it. Yeah. Um, so I think that we've been fortunate that, that we've been able to have Greenwood and Cy form a combination um, and have some t- you know some time together, and um, they are really doing a good job inside for us. Yeah, no, I would uh, 100% back that up. I, I, I'm a big fan of Ellis Yolman and, um, you know, then ha- you, you add Matt Crouch to that equa- equation as well and we've got some real workhorses in there and uh, Matty played a little bit more outside the last couple of games and, and Macker and I and Nicky spoke about Matt's need to just get a little bit more match fitness and, and give himself a little bit more time with the ball. Uh, I felt like his decision-making fell away a little bit against Carlton when they brought the heat, uh, simply because he didn't have as much time. But um, Ellis Yolman is is by far probably the most underrated player um, amongst Crows fans at the moment. Uh, people just Can don't just underestimate. Nikki in the chat saying that um, she says there, which also means that all those calls that Campo hates him was wrong. Nikki, um, I've got a family connection there um, with the Ellis Yolmans, and I can tell you that uh, both he and Sande absolutely hated him and would have been quite happy if he'd left the club. So I can tell you that from uh, from inside the family. So just a little bit of tidbit there. Yep. And that confirms uh, what I've heard as well with regards to what went down uh, as soon as I heard that there was some issues, uh, and we've talked about this already, so we don't need to go on, but I heard there were some issues uh, that Cam had to deal with after Phil passed away. And yep. uh, then the coaching staff just was, weren't on his side. So, No, no yeah. Sando was never interested. Um, Cam Play was never interested. and uh, But anyway, he has uh, defied the odds, and uh, we're now... Um, getting the benefit of that yeah and look port haven't beaten adelaide for quite some time uh we have to go back to round two 2014 uh for the last time that uh, the little brother got over us uh, uh back when uh, was playing. yeah the five minute fireman was still running around uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh Jacking you're getting I, I think he had 31 completely irrelevant uh, disposals that week um so good on him for that uh, but if you look at our... Sorry, sorry Macca, go on. Yeah, I'm backing in. No, Chelsea decided to kick me out there for a while. Yeah. Um, don't know whatever it did to them. <laughs> um, but anyhow, we, we've we won the last five showdowns we have, which is a, a very nice number. Yeah. Make it, make it six this week, I hope. Yeah. And when you look at the stats, uh, the comparables between Adelaide and Port, it's, it's very even. And, of course, stats are hard to pinpoint any... Uh, real deficiency. The only thing that I would suggest is that we, uh, we, we're just more effective with our disposal. Um, we, we have a slight, a slightly higher di- uh, disposal efficiency rating than Port. Um, and we do take more contested marks and, uh, uh, they probably shade us a little bit in clearances, which, uh, Talks talks to what I was saying earlier, but uh, there's not statistically there's not a lot um, between them. Port are a hard working side; uh, they will get around the contest. They will try and get first use. Um, they've got some good ball carriers. Pollock uh, is in good is in good nick, and uh, they've got a couple of young uh, players that are going really well. And Robbie Gray and those sorts are always a bit of a danger. So to yeah. underestimate them would be at our peril, I believe. Yeah, the other thing too is they got thrashing contested ball last week. I think they they were beaten by forty. I think it was, mm, and that's and, very uh, unusual, Macca. It is, and I, and and unfortunately, I think that means that they're going to uh, really concentrate on that because they've, they've had kicks up their ass with that, no doubt. And uh, they'll be talking about the contested ball, contested ball. So, and they'll they'll be bringing back a couple of harder eggs in, uh, into the side as well. So. Um, you, I think you're quite right. I don't think it's going to be an easy game uh, to win. The one area I think that we've got that which is better than theirs is our forward line. We've got uh, a variety of options in our forward line, and I think they particularly Wingard out as well with a hamstring, and I can't see him playing. Mm. Uh, I think they've just got a little less options than we have. The other thing that they lack... To... Sorry, Pete, uh, just one no, other observation I made. Uh, the other thing they lack is a real... Uh, 
rebound defender. Um, you know, our, our stats in terms of rebound 50s and our intercepts uh, numbers are substantially higher than ports on average. And I can't really think of someone that, that, that they would have that would be similar to a Rory Laird um, uh, that can really be a general patrolling that back half. And, uh, uh, you know, in the past we've had Jake Lever. To some degree we have Tom Diday who's able to do that aerially as well. Uh, their their ability to cut off forward uh, movements uh, is not as strong as ours um, and therefore I think what they rely on more so is pressure inside 50, tackles inside 50, that sort of stuff. But I think if our delivery is good, if we get some good service uh, from the midfield into our forward line, I don't think they have the same personnel that are able to cover our big guys, our marking players. No, I think, I think Tarley can count, you know... He- He's good enough and in, in, in such good form at the moment. Um, he can he can handle the big boy up there up the full forward. Uh, and you cut if you can cut him out. Robbie Gray's always a danger up there, of course. And yeah. He's a very very clever footballer. But um, I just don't think that. And young Marshall's not there, which was lends lends support. Uh, Jack Watts, well, he, he really he's had one good game for them. And the rest he's of the ja- he's is, Jack Watts. Well, he's gone back to being... <coughs> he's just being Jack Watts. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's always really, going to be Russian roulette. The interesting thing is, if you go through um, uh, all the, all of their uh, new recruits, um, they, they, a couple of them started with a bit of a bang, but now they've just gone bang full stop, and uh, there's not much out of them. Yeah. Uh, PJ, I, think I'm, I think on paper, if you go through it, Fiend, like you just did, and mm. if you go through it, you know, player by player, line by line, you think well, there's absolutely no way in the world we really should lose this game, and particularly with the players that we've got coming back in. You just um, have to sit there and think, keep your fingers crossed and hope that they don't unpack a, you know, don't get there and unpack a, a Collingwood game or a, you know, or an Essendon quarter or a, you know, which they're capable of doing. And, and that's that's the great unknown with the Adelaide Crows is, is that on any given day they can show up and deliver that kind of output. Um, yeah. So, you, just, you know, all things being equal, you think, well, we shouldn't lose this game, really. You know, the sad yeah. thing, Peter, is that you are right. And uh, we, we should never be thinking of that, that we will roll up and uh, turn out with a game like that. But unfortunately, we are capable of it. And I just don't understand why that when you've got players who you think would be dedicated and uh, want to win every game 100%, that they sometimes come out with this very, very soft version of what, what our normal game is. And uh, like the Collingwood one, well, it, Collingwood, yeah, they won the game and they played some good footy, but we didn't play anywhere near what we could. Well, and let's, uh, without being too pessimistic, let's have a look. We've got a potentially uh, wet Saturday afternoon evening game uh, against an opponent who we suspect will bring the pressure. It's shaping up very much like Collingwood uh, in terms of the, uh, well, situationally. Uh, and we've had a couple of games where you could call us complacent at times uh, against teams that uh, are just honest tries and didn't really stretch us uh, in Gold Coast and Carlton. So the mm. challenge is going to be for the boys to be able to ramp it up from the first bounce uh, and to be able to bring the level of pressure that we know that they can bring. Uh, and, uh, Pete, you're exactly right. It's just their ability to unpack a shitty game, and it's usually a shitty game between the ears. Um, mm. Where we collectively just don't feel like we or look like we feel like being there. Um, so uh, I, you'd hope that they've been sort of uh, circling this one on the calendar and just getting through the Gold Coast and Carlton games um, and stealing themselves for this one. Uh, no Texas, Texas is definitely doing that. Um, he, he he's busting his balls to get back for this one. Mm. Well, the thing is, if they get across this one, they've got the Western Bulldogs. Uh, at home next Friday night, and all of a sudden, with a you know with that the awful injury toll that we've had, at sometimes uh, and and at times tricky draw, although a couple of soft sides thrown in, but generally speaking, you know to, to be at seven two yeah. uh, would be a terrific result given the injuries that we've had. Absolutely, um, and you know seven two with a couple of games before the bye, as you point out. Um, uh, sets us up for a really good tilt after the bye and I think these days that's the way the teams are, uh, all clubs are, are planning their season out, get to the bye in reasonable shape and then have a tilt at it And you've got a, you know, a number of key players that have rested up 
who won't end up having to play full season. So I think that that will end up being you know, my feeling is that that will end up being a positive, um, and and that we've had you know guys come up from underneath and keep us going, and a, and a guy like Sloane will only you know he will only have played three quarters of a season, and I think that that's that's really good. And not yeah, only that, that be, I agree with you. Mm. Sorry, not only that, we've uh, put some games into some young lads. Yeah, exactly. Which, which so, you know, I wanted to, uh, while we're talking about next week, uh, this oh, showdown coming up, a player that I wanted to talk to you about, I just have been tracking a couple of your um, comments on social media over the last week and uh, you've been um, <laughs> fairly outspoken on Daniel Rory Ricardo. Atkins. <laughs> uh, on Rory Atkins. <laughs> So I, th- I figured it might be worth having a chat about the raw. I, I, yep. He's a bit; of, he can be a bit of a polarising figure, and I know that I was, um, I, I was, uh, you know, pretty well known as as a, as a as a lover of his in his early days, and that was I kind of rode him into getting into the side, if that makes sense, because I, I thought he had that ability. But um, I'm much more objective about him these days than I was when he was in in the sandfall. Mm. Um, I'm much less a barracker now than I was um, because I feel vindicated that at least he's got, he's got some games. <laughs> yeah. But, um, um, yeah, um, interesting comments that you made. He's a polarising figure and I just, just – I'm not I'm personally not quite sure where he's at with his football. He's, I, 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 the only thing that I would say about Rat, though, is, is this, and I, I saw a really, really interesting statistic um, on Big Footy, and I reckon it was Red Leg, Red Leg Crow, maybe yeah. I can't remember. His. I thought it was a really interesting statistic. I'd never seen it put up before, and he actually went through and and talked about the players that you have in your side that are capable of bringing out three vote games, mm. and there ain't many. Mm. And he tracked he tracked back five years, and there isn't many. And and you've and you've got a number of guys, of course, the you know the usual suspects who are multiple. Um, yep. Take up multiple of those yeah. threes, yeah. Um, but the rat is one. He is one player who will get, who will, who who can who has got that capability, like a seedsman who's another who's got that capability to turn in a three vote game. Mm. And I I wonder if that's why the club persists with him because oh, they know that if he does turn it on, he's a match winner. Mm. Un- unfortunately, the same guy can be a negative three as well, um, but. Uh, you are right. Uh, at, at his very best, when he's really on, when he's really sharp, when he's really uh, playing more direct football, he can be that, that three player you're talking about. And the interesting thing, I just w- want to make a comparison with him with a, another player from, uh, I've got to do this under Sweets and Smacks, but um, Jack McRae of the Bulldogs uh, was very much uh, an Atkins when he first started. And uh, he got dropped several times because he wasn't hard enough. And that he will tell you they thought he was leerizing around a bit. He, I saw him play this week, and he uh, got forty possessions. He was tagged by Duke Miller the, the, the whole game. Got forty possessions, eight tackles, and just head and shoulders above any other player on the on the ground. And um, he would be the best midfielder going around at the moment in terms of of consistent performance. And this is a guy who was very much like Atkins when he first started. And they, you know, they made his life a little bit, a little bit difficult. And they had a chat with him about it. And he's a left footer like Atkins. Um, and you know, he's turned himself into a fantastic footballer. So Rory's got the material to do it. He just has to have the want and the will to do the work, and because and and to run both ways. My, um, <clears throat> pardon me. My my problem with Rory, and I take your point one hundred percent, Pete. Uh, there are players um, that will be standouts week in week out, and you know they're usually the the cream of the crop in your in your squad. They're earning the big bucks and all the rest of it. And then you've got a mid tier uh, of players that will have average games, good games, average games, good games. And you know we've got a few of those. We've got Richie Douglas. We've got uh, Atkins. We've got. Uh, um, or see other lad Miller is starting to to bob his head up a bit, you know. A lot of these, uh, you know, mid tier, you know, five to seventeen or eighteen on your list sort of thing. The problem that I've got with Atkins is not that he's not always in the votes. The problem I have with Atkins is his ability to play in the style of games that usually gets thrown up in finals. I have I I feel like there's a very 
easily tracking pattern with with the way Atkins plays. If it's a free flowing game, if we've got the game on our terms, if we're able to get the ball outside, if uh, the opponent is playing zone rather than man on man. Um, that's when Atkins will be at his best because he's got time with ball in hand. He's able to to assess what's in front of him and distributes very well. The problem with Rory is that you get him into a contested game, you get into a tight game, um, and you get him with large numbers around the ball. And I feel like he becomes hesitant with his uh, decision making and uh, he either makes bad decisions by foot or he just gets caught with the ball. And the problem is... He tends, he has this habit, and this is only my eye. I, obviously, there's no stats for this, but to my eye, when he does get caught, it's generally defensive side of centre, and it can hurt you. Um, and that's where I worry the most about Rory: the fact that um, he's. I, I feel like he's vulnerable in games uh, that bring finals type pressure. Well, he certainly yeah, means. I think it's absolutely. Uh, he, failed. he had failed when it, when it, when it really mattered. There's no doubt about that. Um, but uh, and I am one of his greatest critics too. I, I'm I'm very much in your camp at the moment, um, Phoenix. But I can see that the raw material is there, and it's the balls in his court if he wants to uh, make himself into that good footballer like McRae did. Um, it's, not everybody starts off being a good footballer or performing at their best. They may give a certain level of performance, but then some some of them just find it within themselves to go up that next level. I don't know whether he ever will. Um, How many games he played? Fiend, do you know? Uh, Sixty. I, I can tell you in just a moment. Uh, he has played sixty-four games. Yep. Sixty-four games. Hmm. Well, it should really start to be showing just a little bit more. Um, I mean, more consistently. Uh, but that I do, I just think he's got a lot of talent, a, re, a lot of real raw talent. But unfortunately, in the big games, he hasn't been trotting it out. He's been trotting out the other Atkins, and we don't like that one. Well, and the mm, thing is, Macca with with Rat, he's not a traditional wingman in that he doesn't have a huge amount of pace. Um, he he takes those little steps, and he's not one that you'll see break away from a pack. He'll use his evasive skills to get free rather than, you know, a turn of speed. Um, and with lads like Jordan Gallucci coming up into the frame, uh, and, you know, Gallucci does have that turn of speed and also, um, you know, can be a little bit wobbly by foot, but is certainly improving in that regard. I think that puts a little bit of pressure on blokes like Rory Atkins because Rory, Rory can't, always, can't expect to always be uh, the last person in a chain of handballs out of a stoppage or, you know, um, free on on the outer wing and 20 metres to run and carry and, and, you know, lace it out to Tex. He's got to be able to adapt his game to provide similar levels of damage and effectiveness in tighter situations when he's got to make quicker decisions. And I think opposition of, of after his, he burst onto the scene at the beginning of last season when he had those six fantastic games, uh, you know, and he came into the focus of the scouts of opposition teams, obviously, and the first instruction would be just watch his hips because if he can get around you with those little steps, then, then he's away. But all you've got to do is watch his hips and you'll bring him down. And he does get ho- caught holding the ball noticeably more in my view than than other people on our list and it's simply because he's generally looking to kick and he's generally looking to evade the first opponent that he comes across and I think they're things that he's maybe got to look at in his game if he wants to take it to the next level in those tighter games I can't argue with any of that yeah interesting just that I'd raise that. I thought he, he's just he's an interesting kind of a player, isn't he? I, I have the feeling though they've invested sixty four games into him. I think they'll stick with him for a bit longer yet. He's a guy that you want to do well because, as Macca rightly points out, he's got some lovely skills and you know what a weapon to have that sort of ability to uh, hit targets the way he can. Mm. You want him to do well, but I think uh, you know the knock on him in his draft year was that, was that he was a little mm. bit lazy with his preparation and, uh, um, you know, he, he was, at the beginning of that season, he was touted to go a lot higher um, than what he eventually went at. And I think 
maybe some of those chickens have maybe come home to roost a little bit in terms of the scouting on Rory and because uh, he ended up going pick 81 and for a lad with that much natural skill and talent 81 is a pretty low pick um yeah, oh, he, yeah he was i mean really he, you know it was uh, it, you know we were the last two left at the school dance he was on one side of the room we were on the <laughs> other and um we, the, nobody, there was nobody left and we had draft sanctions he'd been an ass in, in his in his draft year yep so you know we were, we were both the ugly you know, yeah. the two ugly, the ugly, <laughs> fugly at the draft da- dance hall. Is this and a really, therapy session, Pete? Or it was, <laughs> it was really there was no one else to go home with, and um, it was one of those. I'm, I'm sure we've all been in that situation at five o'clock in the morning in a nightclub when you <laughs> your beer goggled up, and uh, and that's that's what happened. It was a marriage of convenience. There was no, you know, not a lot of science around it. I mean, you know, was, who, you know, do you, at, at pick eighty one, which you know, given the fact that we'd had the sanctions, do you, do you do you just not pick someone, or do you go with someone that is a, is everyone's overlooked because they're a major risk, but he's got some talent there, so you might get something out of him. Yeah. So he, I mean, he's been. I'm a, not sure. He's been a win with sixty four games coming in at pick eighty one, no question about that. But yeah. he always had you're right, he always had that about him and that's why he dropped like a stone. And and let's be honest, if we didn't have draft sanctions that year, there's no way in the world he would have picked him. He wouldn't no he way in the world. No. No, I'm not sure about that, Pete. I remember reading draft reports at the time and they said that we're really happy he managed to slip through to us and we we're really hoping to pick him up <laughs> all the way through. So, um, we didn't expect so him to I think be there. Get off on that one. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We didn't expect him to be there. It was unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, look, I, I was, I was, I think, I think, I think you guys have been a bit hard on the rat, to be honest. Personally, I actually think that his uh, weapons are, are very damaging, and I think that, and I'm not saying you guys don't think that he has damaging weapons, um, but I think that the, some of the negative things that happen in his game get over, over, get over analysed. I think that he uh, maybe tries to be a bit cute, too cute, or to try and play a certain way, and that means he doesn't often take the first best disposal opportunity and often gets caught with it uh, and I think that's probably my biggest knock on him um, but I think this season he's actually I think he's put a better uh, put together a better first half of the season than he did last half, last half of last season but he probably hasn't got back to the heights of where he was at the first half of last season when he was um, you know pre-bleaching um, um, uh, post, post-bleach post rat hasn't been that good but I think the first half of the season has been a lot more quality and workmanlike and the Sydney game the other week, which a lot of us are talking about as being as a finals type game and all that sort of stuff, you know, he was one of our best on ground. So I, I, I don't think that he doesn't have it in the tool bag. It's just that if we can get him to pull out more consistency, I think that's our problem. Fair comment. Mm. Uh, against Sydney, he, actually, he, uh, he kicked that beautiful goal um, at a very, very crucial time. And, uh, and that was under a lot of pressure as well. So, uh, no, you're quite right. It, He's got capabilities. We're not, and I think we've all agreed on that, actually. Um, and at times we see it, but we'd just like to see it more consistently and with a little bit more hardness. Tell you what, there's a wonderful roll call of <laughs> old night <laughs> clubs and pubs going on. At the moment. I was going to add the Black Rose into it. Oh, the well. Black Rose. Love the Black Rose. <laughs> that, was a, that, was a shocking, that was a shocking haunt, that one uh, down in Hiney Street, the old Black Rose. But... Uh, and Jules. Jules. There was some, oh God. Oh, there was some crackers around. Anyway. The track you for a heaven man, Peter. We, no. We, we digress. The, the, track on, the track used to be the Ambassadors and then onto the Oaks and then down to a seedy place called My Place that used to serve you. Yeah, My Place. Uh, cold yep. rice just so that they could get their licence. And you'd just stagger <laughs> out of there. <laughs> <laughs> All oh, the dear. rice had ended up on the floor, and I'm sure they just shoveled it up and served it up again next week. <laughs> Zero idea. <laughs> anyway, anyway, look, Sorry. it is an interesting discussion about rat, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, you know, in a in a season where we've we've thrown in, you know, by and large, some very even team performances with not huge standouts. Um, you know, rat, I guess, is one that I guess could be vulnerable in a full squad. A full healthy squad, um, you could see some options for that position. So, um, you know, let's hope that he can continue to digress, uh, um, progress. I don't disagree with everything that you say, Donkey, but I still fear in highly contested situations. I'd like him to to give us a good gritty twenty five disposal game in a tight match. Maybe this week's the one. Yeah. 
anyone think that we're going to get knocked off this week? Um, I'm well, going to tip us. Well, I never think we are. <laughs> no, I'm going to. I'm tipping us, and I think we should. Um, if if we each, each side pays their top capacity, I'd, I would expect this to win by about twenty eight points. Yeah, yeah, well, that's fair. I think I think the Port are going to come out really tough. It's going to be a slog in the first quarter, and then some point through the second quarter, we're going to break them, and it's going to get out to about ten goals. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think it'll be a slog for a while, and it, weather probably is going to play a part. I believe, um, but I, th- I think yeah, I've taken that into account. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we've got too many weapons. If if we don't unpack. As Pete rightly says, if we don't unpack one of those Collingwood games, because um, then it could get ugly very quickly. Because Port will hurt you if they get a sniff. <clears throat> oh yeah. All right, four uh, crows uh, tips there. And speaking of tips, why don't we just head quickly into competitions uh, with the inimitable Donkey Magoo? All right, let's. Um Off you go, Dunk. Well, because we had such a favourable talking about our competition segment last week, this is a 40-minute <laughs> special episode. <laughs> we're now going to go through each, each team selection over every line. Um, no, we're not going to do that. I like um, a jilted lover uh, you are. Fucking hell. All right. You don't know. You don't know the half of it. Anyway, um, come on. Sorry, I wanted so, to interrupt you. Uh, thank you. Um, look, uh, we've got in the uh, Crowcast tipping, we've got Dominic on... Uh, 45 after eight last week. Uh, Matt on 43 uh, with seven last week. And uh, J-Mac, who's on the chat, uh, on uh, 43 as well after a big eight last week. Uh, everyone else was pretty putrid, um, not just last week, just in general. Um, as we flip across to uh, the Dream Team uh, leagues, uh, we've got um, the leaderboard at the moment with um, So Wheat. Peter um, sitting on uh, 20 points at number one. Um, Dylan FCC on uh, four wins with 16 points. Uh, Corey's there as well, 16 points. Um, and Peanut on uh, in the fourth place on three wins. Uh, three wins gets you all the way down to uh, ninth. Um, so it's a quite a um, tightening up of the uh, tightening up of the top. But also, um, if you're down to about 13th or 14th, you're still in with a chance. Uh, big shout out to um, big shout out to Phoenix who's managed to score back to back wins in uh, beat Sanders. Off, uh, beat Sanders. It's it's held up Sanders. Um, Sanders will probably um, have to give himself a bit of a flogging over that one. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, sure did. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm gearing up my entire season just to ensure that I beat Phoenix because there's nothing else that matters to me anymore. Uh, <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just running through the winners, uh, Skid Kids, Darren, knocked off uh, uh, Donkey's Dream Oats in a heartbreaker. Uh, Pete's Pirates also, again, not Peter J, knocked off the Kuda Beans. Uh, Azza knocked off uh, Baraktos. Um, as we said, uh, Phoenix taking care of um, finger licking good. There's no no moist towelettes left in that box. Um, <laughs> hot habanero sauce is smash through stars in the um, buy of the round. Uh, the second Peter knocked off uh, uh, ASP Rocklift, which is newbie Kimber. Uh, Dylan knocked off Monkey Slappers. Uh, Mick Spuds locked off Brain Surgery. And uh, Peanut uh, uh, went down to One Win Wonders. And that is the wrap of the Dream Team League. Back to you, Phoenix. <laughs> Donkey, you're a legend. <laughs> and just on the theme of competitions, let's have a look at Game of Crows. Oh, no one picked the winner this week. Uh, Mr. Um, uh, bloody, what was his name? <laughs> Doug, Douglas, 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 that's right. Mr. Douglas bobbed up and had a, had a powerful game. Uh, so we only had one point scorers this week. Uh, buckets and uh, dogs and a, and who else? Steve McCrow, Captain of Mads, and uh, Donkey himself scoring one point. Everyone else was yeah. uh, left lamenting. Uh with some very interesting little um, 
uh, AFL fantasy scores. I'm just sorry about the the pause there. I'm just thinking about what I should do this week. I'll, I'll, I'll throw it over to the panel. What do you want to see this week? Pete? Showdown. Yeah, I don't mind Nicky's suggestion. 50 metre penalties. 50 metre? Where uh, am I going to get that stat from, Nicky? Tackles. Ah, tackles. I don't mind it. Have we had tackles yet? Yeah, tackles will do. Whatever. <laughs> Pete's obviously very invested in very invested, invested in Game of Crows because I've, yeah. I've already lost it. So no, we had tackles in round five, dude. We can't do it yeah, again. We... Yeah. All right. So in round four, we had clearances in the first half. So I'm going to balance it out and go clearances in the second half this week. Okay, so that's, we a want good, that's a good call. Clearances after half time. That's probably going to be when the whips are cracking in this showdown. So clearances in the back half of the game are going to be very very important. Uh, don't forget, uh, even if you feel like you're out of the running at the moment with Game of Crows, um, you're never out of the running, and I will be having uh, bonus rounds during the bye weeks, so there'll be an opportunity for those that have fallen behind to get back in amongst it. So keep putting in your tips on uh, Twitter and Facebook and or Bigfooty. Uh, Twitter, of course, AFL Crowcast, Facebook AFL Crowcast, um, and the results are posted weekly on our website, aflcrowcast.com. That's it for Game of Crows. Before we finish up, Macca, you want to uh, smack someone down? I will say a kiss from your man. That's what I am. And I really don't care who knows it. Why are you going, mate? Well, you know, I'll, I'll give Sam McClure and Brian Taylor a bell around the head just for being alive. I hate <laughs> But uh, the one I, one I had really in mind was, and it has been mentioned, our coach. And look, Pikey, to have some uh, believability, mate, this bullshit about the stuff behind the knee and all that, it was you knew straight away it was a bloody hamstring and you, you're talking about this tendon or this little lot spot behind the knee. And you look like an absolute yarrow trying to worm your way around <laughs> saying the word hamstring. And uh, I've been a big fan of yours. Don't ruin it coming up with bullshit like that. So whack, take that, mate. What? Keep going. Any more? No, Any sweets? No, oh, look, no sweets. No, I'll, have, I'll give BT a whack. I'll give BT a whack. I, I know that we whack him every week, but did anybody hear his commentary on the weekend with, on Jake Lever? No, I, I mean, didn't. That, 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 is, that is beyond you know, pumping up a play, that is, that surely is somebody who's being paid. It's a pay, it was a paid advertisement in, in trying to pump up Lever's tyres and convince the, 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 the people watching, the viewers, that, um, you know, even though his stats weren't uh, showing it, that he was actually having a very, very effective game. It was, mm. it was the funniest and qu- most quite unbelievable commentating I've ever heard. He, he's obviously on the payroll. Well, he's either that or he's trying to protect his own credibility at this point because uh, mm. he, he had everyone believing that Lever was the second coming of Christ over in Victoria and uh, uh, just uh, as that one went down, uh, Lever's been quite disappointing as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Just for a sweet, um, yeah, Richard Douglas, uh, we, you know, we give him a kick up the ass quite regularly and uh, he gets plenty of uh, whips across the back as a whipping boy. But I thought his game was uh, outstanding on the weekend and it showed what he can. His first half wasn't all that uh, much to write about, but his second half was outstanding. And uh, well done, Dougie. It was great to see you, mate. Big sweet for you. Look, the only smack that I've got is uh, our favourite uh, fireman, um, <laughs> Five Minute Kane. And, uh, you know, there's a number of things that we could give him a, a whack about. But something caught my attention the other day. Um, on Twitter, and I just, you know, if you if you're going to be that's that guy, that uh, shock jock kind of guy or whatever, then at least be consistent. And he's come out this week, and he's had a crack at someone who's asked him what happened um, back in 2007. Uh, the comment was, you know, what also happened to you in 2007, Kane, a 20 goal grand final flogging. Now Kane's response to that. Was yeah, it did. And my son was born with a serious heart condition, and we spent months in hospital. He's doing well at the moment. Thanks for asking. Now, for someone who was <coughs> whose wife got on radio and all the rest of it, crying about the invasion of privacy and protecting the family and all the rest of it, 
for him to use his family and his son's heart condition as a as a attempted smackdown of someone on Twitter, Kane, you're an absolute flog. Massive well, smack from me. He's a corns. Well, he's just uh, in, the, in the words of the great Paul J. Keating. Uh, he's just a shiver looking for a spine to run up. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, it's probably uh, good that on that note we call it a night, guys. It's been a very good one this week. Uh, Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Maka. I hope you're both feeling better over the next couple of days. And uh, Donkey, thanks for coming along as well. We will... uh, Good to be with you. (laughs) Thanks, John Laws. Um, (laughs) And, of course, we'll be with you again on Sunday night for the wrap. Thanks, guys. Yep, good night, all. Good night.